Good morning and welcome everyone as we meet to share together in this act of worship, whether you're with us here in the church building or else sharing with us from afar, everyone is very welcome as we worship together. We hear these words from the psalmist. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let our foot slip. He who watches over us will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over us. The Lord is our shade at our right hand. The sun will not harm us by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep us from all harm. He will watch over our life. The Lord will watch over our coming, our coming and our going, both now and forevermore. We stand to sing the first of our hymns, number 80, to the name of our salvation, Lord and honour, let us pay. Number 80. Please sit. There are just a few notices to share concerning activities happening in the life of the church. Things are gathering pace. We begin today the season of Advent, working towards Christmas itself. And so this evening we have our Advent candlelight service led by the church choir with readings and prayers as appropriate. And everyone is invited to come along and share in this service this evening, half past six here in the church. And there will be refreshments afterwards. So please, if you can, do come along. And then next Saturday morning is our winter spring clean. Once a quarter, we set aside a Saturday morning to clean the church. And next Saturday is our winter 
cleaning morning. So if you are available from 10 o'clock next Saturday, you're very welcome to come along and help with the cleaning of the church. Many hands do make light work, and the more who come, the less I have to do. So please do make every effort to come and share in that exciting adventure next Saturday morning. There are at the back of the church cards to be signed. As you know, traditionally we have sent Christmas cards to those within the fellowship of the church who have moved to other places in the world. And we like to be able to greet them personally. So there are cards available. They need to be signed at, at best today, today maybe, maybe next, next week if possible. possible. But, but we, we do need to get them sent off as soon as we can. So please, at the end of service today, don't go away without having signed the cards which are at the back of the church, which we send to our friends overseas. And then in amongst the trivia, there is of course one serious matter. By now, I imagine everyone is aware that Simon Croft passed away early this last week after a short illness, very sudden and very unexpected. As you can imagine, Swaneng and Charlotte are devastated by this. At the same time, they're very grateful for the prayers and the loving concern that is being shown to them at this difficult time. At present, there are no details concerning funeral arrangements, but we will keep folk informed as and when that information becomes available. But please, if you can find a moment in your prayers, please do remember Swaneng and Charlotte at this most difficult time. We pray together. Let us all pray. Power filled God, you, the God who has created all that there is, the God who has created everything out of nothing, we worship you. For without you, we are nothing at all. It is you alone who has made something of us. Indeed, we give you thanks for the gifts of your grace in and through which you are always and forever making and remaking us in your image, shaping us, molding us, fashioning us according to your likeness, enabling and empowering us according to your purpose, directing us toward and determining for us a future that is in accord with your destiny concerning all that you have made. We thank you for Jesus, the one in and through whom all of this is revealed, the one who is the embodiment of your eternal glory, the one who was prepared to humble himself for our sake, that we might attain to the glory that was otherwise reserved to him. Thank you too for the Holy Spirit actively present amongst us, enlivening each one of us, awakening us to the reality that is your coming kingdom, that for which we continue to pray as we share together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In a moment, we're going to listen to the song from YouTube, it's a very singable tune. Indeed, some of you will recognize it for what it is. But don't just listen, 
sing along with it. It goes at a bit of a lick, so you have to keep up, but it's okay. So we listen and we sing together. We are God's people, the chosen of the Lord. <laughs> Some of you were singing along. I think Brahms is spinning in his grave, as he, if he'd have heard that, but there we are. Um, we come to Advent, the first Sunday in Advent, and we have an empty stable, and we have a bare tree, because we're at the beginning of the season. It's worth reminding ourselves that the stable which in due time will receive Mary and Joseph and will be the place within which baby Jesus is born. The stable didn't emerge out of nothing on Christmas morning. It was always there, as it is now. As Advent unfolds, we'll come to get to know the stable more intimately. We'll discover who lives there every day for whom it is their natural home, as it prepares to receive one who is supernaturally born into our midst. And the tree, like many other trees growing in the forests, as they are, over the weeks, we will decorate the tree and bring it to life, and it will become part of our Christmas experience. The season of Advent is meant 
to remind us that Christmas should grow on us. It doesn't just happen, it grows on us. It has been growing within the mind of God even from the beginning of time. Growing within the hearts of God's people over hundreds of years. Growing within the heart of the church over these next few weeks. So as we share together during this Advent season, we will ourselves grow into what will be a climax of it all on Christmas Day. And we remind ourselves of this growing together as we light the Advent wreath. Grateful to those who prepared it for us, the four red candles to be lit each week as we go through the season and then the final white candle to be lit on Christmas Day itself. I resisted the temptation to say four candles. <laughs> it's four red candles. So, Joe, as you're the closest to it, and I know you sat there because that's what you wanted to do, really, come and light the first of the candles. There should be a match in there. <laughs> Honestly. Pray together. Loving God, we thank you for the warmth of the season of Advent. We thank you that over these few weeks we will find ourselves growing into it, the increasing realization of its significance for us. And so we commend our work and worship over this next month trusting that in the power of your Spirit, we too would find ourselves growing into Christmas, ready to receive baby Jesus, the one who is for us, Saviour and Lord. Let it be so for his sake. Amen. Now Mary's going to read for us. We sing together from the hymn book, the hymn number 89, the race that long in darkness pined has seen a glorious light. Number 89.
Please sit. Those of you who may have been brought up as children to go to church and were part of children's group, Sunday school, and so on, may well have played a game called sword drill. Sword drill was when each of you took a Bible and you tucked it under your arm like that, and the person who was leading the meeting would throw out a Bible verse, and you had to draw your sword and find the verse. And the person who was first to find the verse won a prize. And sometimes the verses were very easy, and people went to them very quickly. And sometimes they were relatively obscure and took a long time to find. I have a feeling if we prayed sword drill this morning, and I said to you, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 19, most of us would take our time finding it. It's not a book we read that often. Indeed, it's likely that the words of the prophet Habakkuk would have been destined for that relative obscurity that attaches to most of the so-called minor prophets of the Old Testament. If it were not for the fact that Paul, in his first letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 17, quotes Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, who is justified through faith shall gain life. The righteous will live by being faithful. So Paul plucks this verse out of obscurity and sets it four square at the start of his magnum opus, the letter to the Romans. If that weren't enough, along comes Martin Luther, and Luther reads Paul's letter to the Romans. And Luther stumbles across Romans chapter 1, verse 17, otherwise known as Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And Luther tells us it was in the reading of that verse and its understanding that God spoke to him in such a way that he knew himself converted from what he was to what he was to become. the doctrine of justification by faith. And so it can be argued that the whole of the Protestant Reformation is dependent upon what might some regard as Luther's dodgy interpretation of Paul's letter, which in turn is dependent on what might be thought of as a dodgy interpretation of the words of Habakkuk 2.4. So be careful what you write because someone else might read it, and they may make of it something you never intended for its use. Who would have thought that the whole of the Protestant Reformation was founded upon one verse tucked away in an otherwise anonymous prophet of the Old Testament? But enough of that. If you were listening to the reading, the prophet describes himself as a watchman, a lookout, one standing on the watchtower. And language, of course, is interesting. Depending where you place the emphasis, the meaning can change. So what we have is a lookout, someone who is looking out. A lookout, someone who is looking out. The immediate context is the advancing Assyrian army, which was marching on Jerusalem. It had swept all before it. There was need for someone to be looking out, watching, ready to sound the alarm. As soon as it came into sight, this fearsome army of Assyria, so that the people of the city would have as much time as possible to prepare themselves to defend Jerusalem in whatever way possible or at the very least to ensure that those who were outside of the city walls, those working in the fields and wherever, had ample time to get back into the relative safety of the city itself, to see to it that there were enough provisions stored away to be able to withstand a lengthy siege. 
The work of the watchman was vital in this respect. The whole future of the city and its people depended on that person being awake and alert to what was happening before them. To be able to watch closely for an extended period of time is no easy thing. It's all too easy to lose concentration, to do what my father used to describe as resting one's eyes. All too easy to look away for a moment, and in that moment, it is all too late. Watching and waiting, waiting and watching, none of this comes easy to any of us. Indeed, those two words really come together now. I was trying to think of an example of when we both wait and watch at the same time. The only one I could come up with was on a bus stop. You're waiting for the bus to come and you're watching for the bus to come. You know the bus is coming, but you're still looking out for it. You're waiting and you're watching. Often we wait for whatever. We look out for this and that, but to watch and to wait together is a challenge in itself. Advent reminds us of the promise of God to be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, the one for whom the people of God watched and waited, waited and watched for centuries. Indeed, there are those who would continue to wait and to watch for his coming. But the Christian faith teaches us that the promise of Messiah has found its fulfillment in Jesus. The waiting is over. No longer need we to be watching. He has come. Perhaps the most personal, the most poignant expression of this is what we find in Luke's Gospel. The story of Simeon, the one whom Luke tells us was in the temple, one who had been watching and waiting. When the infant Jesus was brought in to be circumcised, Simeon exclaims, I have seen with my own eyes the deliverance you have made. The words of Simeon which have passed into the, the liturgy of the church as the Nunc Dimittis, now lettest thy servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. He had waited for so long. He had been watching, and he had been vindicated in his patience. Contrast that with John's comment in the prologue to his gospel. He came to his own, and his own people did not even recognize him. But then the Advent season invites us to watch and wait, to wait and watch for what we know of as the second Advent, which is not an easy doctrine, and we don't need to worry too much about it this morning. How do we make sense of it, though? Well, it may help to remind ourselves that as Christians, we now are encouraged to see by faith and not by sight. To see by faith and not by sight. An altogether different way of viewing the world and what is happening around us, of making sense of what is going on, of discerning what is likely to happen in the near and far future, what we can hope for, what we can aspire to, what we needs must be fearful of, what we must prepare for and against. An altogether different way of appreciating the world of which we are a part. A spirit-given ability to discern the signs of the times. The ability to realize that even in the deepest darkness, the light of Christ will continue to shine. Indeed, more than that, to burn ever brighter. And if we can get that sense of seeing by faith rather than by sight, 
of appreciating that what we're talking about is not necessarily chronological, but more existential in its application. We will find ourselves able to resolve the apparent paradox which the New Testament contains as it describes the kingdom of God in terms of now and not yet. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is coming. That kingdom being in the world, yet not of the world. And perhaps most challengingly of all, to remind us of Jesus' words when he took a little child and placed them in the midst of the disciples and dared them to realize that unless the kingdom of God was received as a little child would, it would be denied them. The kingdom of God only makes sense if we're able to receive it as a little child would receive it. As someone once wrote, with tongue in cheek, but maybe not, no room for adults in the kingdom of God. No room for adults in the kingdom of God. A mature faith, but one which is always childlike in the way it presents itself. That's a challenge we bring to the world of today when we look at the way the grown-ups are managing the affairs of the world and the mess they're making of it. The world is too serious a place and what is happening in the world is far too serious, whether it be on our doorstep or far afield, far too serious to be left to the grown-ups. It's time for the children to take the stage and the baby will be born. God knew what he was doing when he determined to make himself known to the world as a little child. Advent invites us to reappraise the nature of our faith and of its practical outworking by being reminded that the God who possesses the power to bring worlds into being out of nothing has chosen to self-identify with humankind as a baby. The God who brought worlds into being out of nothing self-identifies with humankind as a baby the miracle of the Incarnation. We need to understand that. It is not for us to downplay its significance. No, it's for us to play it up for all it's worth. The God who brought worlds into being is self-identifying with us as a baby. Because if we're prepared for that, then it needs must have an effect on us. It cannot leave us untouched. It will cause us to reshape our perception as far as notions of power and authority and wealth and prestige are concerned. Kings came to the stable and they were forced to bow their knee. And when their knees touched the ground, well, you know what it was like to they found on their clothes when they came to leave. The muck and the mess of the stable had tarnished their finery. It causes us to reappraise our sense of what it means to talk of power and authority, of wealth and prestige. It causes us to reappraise what we understand by notions of dependence and humility and of service and of devotion the care that was necessary for a newborn baby. We know it. What must it have been like for those in that stable? It will cause us to reappraise our sense of sacrifice and of love and of care. All of this is demanded of us in the light of the coming of Christ. But this is only possible if we perceive these things through the eyes of faith. This second coming 
of which we speak can only be glimpsed when the eyes of faith are wide open. And so we wait and we watch, we watch and we wait, looking out for signs of the kingdom, always on the lookout for opportunities to give expression to the faith we espouse, always being prepared, always ready to embrace the moment whenever it presents itself. We make our prayerful response. And as we pray, we remember before God all those for whom we would pray, those close to us, about whom we are worried, anxious and concerned. For those within the family of the church for whom these are trying times. The recently bereaved, those who are seriously ill and their loved ones, those who are lonely, those struggling to cope financially, emotionally, spiritually those for whom Christmas has a hollow ring to it, those who just want it to be over, whatever it is. And then let us pray remembering the awful events in the English Channel this last week, asking God for forgiveness where appropriate for attitudes and approaches that dehumanize our fellow sisters and brothers. And asking God to encourage amongst us a spirit of generosity and of welcome, of hospitality and of loving concern. Let us pray for all those affected by the adverse weather we are presently experiencing. Lives have been lost, property damaged, livelihoods affected. And let us pray too for everyone involved in monitoring the unfolding situation as regards COVID and its impact on our immediate situation. 
but also those countries which are most exposed to its most vir recent virulent expression. Let us then pray for the Church and for our own congregation as we embark upon this Advent season that we might always be on the lookout for signs of the Kingdom of God, enlarging its influence, extending its impact, confronting the darkness of evil with the light of forgiving love. Amen. And so our service moves towards its close. Remind you, as has become customary, we do not take up an offering during the service, but if anyone has come prepared to give, then opportunities are there when you leave. We also have opportunities for you to look at the the crafts that were prepared for the bazaar and other things too that are available for sale and gift by donation. We thank you for your generosity in supporting all of these ventures. Don't forget to sign the cards and enjoy tea and coffee. And to my amazement, there are even mince pies and it's not even December. Wow. Our closing hymn is number 240. Lift up your heads, you mighty gates. We stand to sing 240. from the letter to the Hebrews concerning God's work in Christ as relevant today as ever. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifices himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Please sit. <clears throat> 